Um, welcome back everyone to the first sociology panel, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, so I'll be moderating this for you. Um, I've looked at, at the panel speakers and I, I'm going to just give my apologies in advance for going to butcher everybody's name. Uh, uh, so I, I hope you don't mind. I have a name that's unpronounceable so uh, to many. So, you know, I, I, I sympathize with you uh, when I when I do this to you. Um, so we, we have four speakers lined up, very exciting. Um, just to remind the speakers, you have 20 minutes each, uh, followed by 10 minutes of questions. I will raise in the chat, I'll raise my hand in the chat um, when you have two minutes left. And should you go over time so much that it becomes a problem that I'll, I'll uh, unmute myself and barge in. Uh, that, that is unlikely to be necessary. So uh, and if I do so, I'll do so very gently. Um, our first speaker, apologies for the mispronunciation, is Joao Pedro uh, Amorim, uh, who will present a paper titled Blank Screens, the Revolutionary Aesthetics of Boredom. Uh, Joao uh, is a visual artist and PhD candidate at the C Research Center for Science and Technology of the Arts with his C uh, FCT fellowship. His papers have been published in the next journals. Uh, his film on shadows and their names was premiered in uh, Doc Lisboa 2020. Um, Previously, he was a research fellow at Digital Creativity. He holds a master's in contemporary artistic uh, uh, and a bachelor's in communication sciences from the University of Porto. Between 2014 and 15, uh, he collaborated with the collective uh, Caucaso Factory in uh, Bologna and Berlin in several film projects as an assistant uh, director. Looking forward to your, talk, to your talk and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, are, are you seeing my presentation? Uh, yes, I yes. can see it and I assume the others can too. Okay, uh, so I will go uh, ahead. So uh, my PhD project moves around the identification, description and discussion of dis dissident artistic practices. Uh, that is, art forms that can somehow critically challenge the dominant narratives within our society and in particular uh, in relation to the contemporary regime of images and information uh, that is based on proliferation, excess and uh, saturation. A regime of images that is directly tied to a capitalist uh, political and economic system. In this context, blank screens, whether white, grey or black, are the epitome of dissidence within visual arts, as they critically challenge all the codes and expectations of, of screen-based media. Uh, while many aspects should be taken into account in such an, an analysis, uh, in this working paper I'll focus on boredom, which uh, even if it's not, main, uh, uh, not the aim of the artists, uh, it is a natural result uh, of uh, these works. Uh, I'll start by a very brief presentation of two different concepts that can be operative for our analysis of contemporary societies, post fordism and cognitive capitalism. Uh, there are many other concepts that uh, we could use to describe our society, but these two are the, the ones that I think better illustrate our argument. So Fordism is a concept that takes its name from the serialization and the innovations that Henry Ford introduced in his factories in the 20s and 30s that became, a stru uh, became structural to, uh, with Roosevelt's New Deal, after which it became spread all over the world. We can understand it as a stage of development of capitalism that intensified social transformations that were ongoing at least since the Industrial Revolution. In itself, Fordism describes the new conception of the industrial production process as a significant increase in efficiency and productivity according to specific measures and forms of labor organization. At the same time, such a, trans such a transformation of production leads naturally to a transformation of the democratic and, and also autocratic regimes with capital accumulation becoming the central goal and criteria for measuring process, to measure how uh, successful uh, a, a, a given society is. Hence, on one hand, specific methods of economic regulation emerged to achieve the aforementioned goals, but most importantly for our paper, Fordism became a social, uh, societal uh, paradigm. Quoting Igor Prybuk, in nuclear family, uh, family households uh, on which it was based, the Fordist economy encouraged the consumption of standardized goods and services. 
The state assumed an important role in the negotiations between employers and employees. The tripartite renegotiations between capital, labor and the state became the basis for ensuring long-term stable conditions of production and consumption, a prerequisite for, for this new value creation. Uh, in the mid-70s, uh, a steep increase in productivity, uh, in the 80s, the dominance of neoliberalism, Thatcherism, Reaganism above all, and in the 90s, the downfall of the socialist alternative, transformed uh, so deeply our societies and our economies, along with the technological development, that Fordism, as a model, as a model to understand uh, reality, became outdated or at least insufficient. Post-Fordism is what comes after Fordism, but it also suggests that something at the core of Fordism remains. It is an evolution, not necessarily a complete break. Uh, while industry has remained relevant, the tertiary sector of services has assumed the greater preponderance with robotics and automation. The percentage of uh, workers working in factories has decreased uh, despite the increase of productivity. This means that the, regula the regulatory systems that existed during Fordism uh, between capital, state and labor were weakened in the name of flexibilization and freedom, uh, and freedom, that is, uh, precariousness. Unions lost power, laws protecting labor were weakened, and the figure of the freelancer emerged as a major player in the new economics. Moving away from the production line, new jobs have a post-disciplinary post nature. While most workers still have to follow schedules, there has been a growing flexibility in its management. However, flexible schedules don't represent a better life-work balance. On the contrary, people seem to not be able to stop answering emails and completely breaking away from work, which is raising concerns rega regarding the right, our right to uh, disconnect. For this paper, what interests us is how the conjunction of flexibility, growing competition between workers, as forms of collective organization struggle to survive, uh, and a cultural landscape that promotes non-stop theories of self-improvement. How this conjunction uh, can help us thinking uh, artistic practices and, and, and explain the importance of boredom in itself. Uh, for this society was, according to Byung Shul Han, a disciplinary society and hence a society of negativity. It was defined by prohibition. In post-Fordism, subjects are driven by a desire of activity and achievement. With this comes the desire, the obsession with self-fulfillment, of finding some occupation that can be significant, that can represent uh, a dream. As, as Byung Shul Han notes, if disciplination and negativity are being slowly, or not so slowly, replaced by achievement and positivity, this doesn't constitute a break, but rather a, uh, a certain continuity, in, particularly, in particular where increasing product productivity is concerned. So post-Fordism, even more than Fordism, is a regime defined by the accumulation of capital, even more extreme and absurd, as the accumulation of capital has become, uh, in some situations, disconnected from the actual production of goods and services, mostly through financialization. It's under this perspective that the achievement subject internalizes instances of domination. Quote in hand, this subject is lord and master of itself, at the same time that he's a, a, a victim of oppression of himself. However, the, the disappearance of domination doesn't, does not entail freedom. As we, as we must be happy and free and produce, we should remember that in Western political debate, uh, the right equates freedom with the freedom of production and the freedom of economic movement. Um, so, constraint in this scenario, constraints co coincide with freedom. As we are instilled to be active and proactive, we indulge in compulsive freedom and self-exploitation. We must be constantly active. But the achievement subject is not only such, uh, such as a worker, but also as a consumer. In fact, some argue that the condition of citizen is being replaced by that of the consumer. It's in this context that it makes sense to discuss the connection between post-Fordism and cognitive capitalism. To do so, I will take this short quote uh, in, from an interview in 2004. The CEO of France Television uh, stated that from a business perspective, the goal of the activity of France Television was to sell availability in the human brain. 
Patrick Lalay was in fact expressing something that has was obvious since the post-war, uh, but that, that has been becoming even more dominant, uh, as we can see also in our nowadays society. Uh, around this time, uh, Bernard Stiegler published in French uh, Symbolic Misery, uh, where he describes how the society of control, communication and advertisement uh, disturbed our sense of community, our sense of feeling together, uh, and our sense of feeling together. According to Stiegler, in order to dispose of the immense overproduction of unnecessary goods, the industry developed an aesthetic, especially in audiovisual media, which refunctionalized the aesthetic dimension of the individual according to the interests of industrial development, causing him to adopt the behaviors of consumerism. For Stiegler, this meant that we are living in an epoch of symbolic, libidinal, and effective misery. Uh, according to this perspective, it is as if our consciousness has become the main commodity with the highest exchange value. Uh, Stigler reminds us that aesthesis, the general concept of aesthetics, has to do with sensitivity and that politics and aesthetics are naturally connected as, politi as a political, and I'm quoting, as a political community is a community of a feeling or sensing, a community that feels, desires, imagines in common. That's why, and I'm quoting him, in today's controlled societies, aesthetic weapons play an essential role. It has become a matter of controlling the technologies of aesthetics, and in this way, controlling the conscious and unconscious rhythms of bodies and souls, modulating through the control of flows, uh, these rhymes, uh, rhythms of consciousness and life. Um, so it is in this context of saturation of an excess of images that we that we live with 24 7 that we claim that blank screens can persist side by side with boredom and sleep as the last domains of resistance to this flow of images uh, that that is an, a, an expression of the post-disciplinary capitalist society uh, as a consequence we'll discuss the the, the role of boredom a little bit ahead First, we, we must justify the particular relevance of cinema in this analysis. As many scholars and filmmakers have noticed, cinema is born from an original sin. Cinema is always, since the beginning, where you had to put a coin in a box to watch a small film, has always been tied to the industry. Uh, quoting Stigler, cinema occupies a unique position in the temporal war that is the cause of the contemporary symbolic misery. At once, industrial technology and art. Cinema is the aesthetic experience that can combat aesthetic conditioning on its own territory. And so uh, the first thing that I will be presenting is perhaps the, mo the, the one that most radically combats aesthetic conditioning on its own territory. Hollings for Sad was made in 1952 by Guy Debord. Uh, Debord would write and film uh, in the late 60s the Society of the Spectacle. An, inte an intellectual endeavor that poses many of the questions that we are discussing in this presentation. Its central thesis is that in the society of, uh, of, of the time, images were being used as a spectacle and as such were mediating the relationships between humans as well as socially constructing relations of power and hegemony. More importantly, images were working as a sort of apparatus to distance and alienate humans among themselves. The image that we are seeing belongs to a later film from 76, and uh, it's, in, it's an intertitle, and it says, here the spectators, deprived of everything, will furthermore be deprived of images. We can see that implicit is the idea that images came to replace the everything that the spectators as social subjects are deprived of. And the radical gesture of the Bort cinema is to remove those images or to deconstruct them in order to make bright the alienation and the absence, the deprivation of everything that images hide and obscure. In reality, decades before, Debord did literally that in Urlemann pour, sa uh, pour Sade. The film has about 60 minutes, uh, of which about 50 minutes are comprised of a black, sc black screen and no soundtrack, and only 10 minutes uh, have a white screen and sound or textual compositions.
Uh, by rejecting representation, the Bog was proposing a new cinema, transcending it and transcending its death. Our cinema is dead. Its images, it's always images of the past. And the board's looking for a live cinema that can counter the spectacle of popular cinema. It is a moment in which the spectator retakes his position as a political subject, capable of questioning his own position. In 2000, uh, our our next example, uh, it's from the 2000. Uh, Jean-César Montaigne adapted Snow White by Robert Falser to the cinema, a text that imagines the reconciliation of Snow White with her stepmother after her tentative killing. The film opens with the photographs of the writer when he was found dead, despite not having been planned as a film completely black. Uh, at a certain moment, César Montaigne decided to do just that, to make a film almost entirely uh, black. You see... Uh, Uh, as he claimed, he, uh, he stopped. Uh, in this film, a shade of grey would be projected while the characters uh, read their text. I took off the sound in this in this fragment, but there would be text being read uh, with short intervals of a blue sky and some music. Uh, the film would go uh, as for as for seventy five minutes, and it would close with a silent, uh, all uh, with a silent shot of the director. simply saying no. I cannot play and read at the same time, I'm sorry. But uh, it isn't clear what was the motivation behind this gesture. In any case, as the director is a cinephile and a provocative filmmaker, we can interpret this gesture in two ways. One, as a recognition of cinema as a composition of sound and light. And, and this light can be absent or it can be black. Uh, and still have a value in itself, disconnected from representation. Two, has a challenge to the spectator and his expectations, that is, to see faces and bodies on screen. The only, uh, and in this film, the only moving body that we see is this one uh, of the uh, director. Uh, the last film that we overview is Amor Omnia by Yohei Yamakadu, that was inspired also by uh, Branka de Neve. Uh, the film is, has a similar structure, it's almost all black with the reading of bucolics of Virgil uh, in Latin, and then some fragments of film uh, spread throughout the film where we see uh, friends in a city translating the text of Virgil from Latin to French. One of the characters, Solène, asks to another, Mana, how one should translate a given word from Latin to French, to what she answers, it depends on the context and on our imagination. Imagination. In this, in this film, the, blanks, the black screen appears as a visual silence, as part of a visual composition that can have a rhythm composed of images and their absence. At the same time, the black screen becomes a surface where our imagination works while we listen to the suggestive and very visual poetry of Virgil. It is as if we were following the characters in their task of reading and translating uh, visual. I will skip this reference. Uh, why do I claim that these three works that we've shortly overviewed, and I'm sorry for the extreme briefness, uh, engage in dissident or uh, revolutionary political aesthetics? First, because in the middle of all the noise and information that we live in, to play with visual silence is in itself a statement that challenges hegemonic representations because recognizing the absence of light as a valuable form of expression empowers our sensitive body, creates rhythm within our consciousness, and therefore the possibility of a suspension or a breakaway from the stream of images that we consume every day. It is a form of anti-cinema because the blank screen cannot impose us an agenda, but rather releases us from a passive position of consumer, bringing us to an active challenge, to become aware of our place and our thoughts, to project them onto the black screen and to accept some aesthetic proposal that is quite difficult to follow. Going back to the early 20th century, we can find an early example of this kind of practice in Malevich. He believed that representation was often dominated by religious, economic or broadly utilitarian interests. 
even if eventually it could release itself in the future, still representation was more of a hindrance that limited our ability to reach the most important dimension of an artwork, the feeling of rhythm. Describing his black square, he claimed that the square equals feeling and the white field equals the void beyond this feeling. As such, he claimed that art no longer cares to serve the state and religion. It no longer wishes to illustrate the history of manners. It wants to have nothing further to do with the object as such and believes that it can exist in and for itself without things. I believe that the films that we've discussed belong in the same realm and that such a realm is deeply political as it values non-utility over utility. How does one feel when uh, one watches a blank screen? It is very difficult not to experience boredom in these situations. In fact, in the context of a constant excess of stimuli, information and impulses, to be found in a moment where our dominant sense vision is inactive is deeply challenging. On a personal note, I often feel that I experience boredom as something not only uncomfortable, but almost agonizing. Uh, for simplicity, I'm taking here boredom as a monolithic concept, believing that its differentiation lays in the way we experience it. Uh, sometimes I cannot wash my teeth or cook without being listening to something or watching random pages on my phone. And he, random, it's important. It's not, uh, I'm not doing anything, actually. Uh, I, I believe that that's due to our coexistence with the flow of information that is an expression of post fordism and cognitive capitalism that promotes constant activity. Boredom is experienced negatively when we feel it is boycotting our vita activa, the fact that we shouldn't be wasting time when our conscious is Consciousness is constantly alert. For Han, this constitutes a regression as constant alertness and multitasking is commonplace among wild animals. It is an attentive technique indispensable for survival in the wilderness. While we need such an ability, what we're witnessing is that alertness and activity is taking over all the hours of our day, which bring us closer to the state of animals. Uh, if boredom is the dream bird that hatches the egg of experience, if it, it, it is the peak of mental relaxation, boredom stands alongside with sleep as the last space free of the flow of images. As such, it is not only a political and social matter, but also a health issue. We should experience, uh, we should be able to experience profound boredom without anxiety. Um, uh, very shortly, based on Sosa Santos' model of the ecologies of knowledge, I claim that boredom challenges the monoculture of, of capitalist logic of productivity, based on the arguments that I've presented throughout the presentation, and that to engage with boredom expands the notion of reality by including realities rendered absent by silence, suppression and marginalization. Therefore, to experience boredom amplifies the present and can create deeper knowledge. At the same time, I believe that a moment of boredom consists in an opportunity to install a process of political subjectivation. That is, every time we are bored, there is a possibility of regaining or reclaiming our agency as a political subject by being aware of our own conditions of alienation. As such, I believe that when we find ourselves in front of a blank screen and we feel bored, as long as we are not anxious or obsessed with some other issue, we are experiencing the action of uncounted capacities that crack open the unity of the given and the obviousness of the visible in order to sketch a new topography of the possible. In the words, this in the words of Jacques Ancien. Uh, as a conclusion, I claim that art forms that allow space to boredom are political as one, they provide an alternative or a dissidence from the hegemonic utilitarian social structures of representation. Uh, amplifying the pre by amplifying the present and the possibilities of knowledge and hence by amplifying the topo topography of the possible. And sex second, I'd like to remember Georges Bataille, who in the birth of art mentioned that probably boredom or rather tedium uh, and chance uh, were at the bottom of the first artistic manifestations of mankind. According to Bataille, Art was in its sense sacred as an opposition of the profane world of work. By allowing boredom, they allow us the con conditions for the birth of new art forms. And by creating the conditions for the reproduction of boredom and the reproduction of art, it is also reproduced the possibility of radical dissent. 
Of course, as we've seen in other presentations, and I will conclude with this, the challenge remains, how can we guarantee that the experience of boredom might be free of anxiety? That it can be a positive and not a negative experience. I f in, in my opinion, and this is just a very short opinion, uh, I think we cannot guarantee that or we cannot even aim to reach that. Uh, to do it, we would have to transform boredom in an utilitarian experience, and by doing so, we would be, we would be already boycotting the profound experience of boredom. Uh, and that is my presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much for your talk. I, uh, I, I've, before we ask, we have a little bit of time for questions. Can I just ask if you? Did you notice my hand raising? Uh, I, mean, I don't. I can't hear anything or so. So I don't know if, if this actually shows up when you're presenting. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I couldn't see. I was in, in my presentation and I couldn't see. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, that's what I suspected. That's fine. Uh, but so that I know, then, <laughs> then uh, I, I know that my signals may not be visible. So, uh, so that's good to know. Can I just? Does anyone have any questions? Maybe a couple of short ones. Uh, don't you any raised hands? Um, so, so I have a, a question. So, this is definitely not my area of expertise. But what I what I uh, did find very interesting is your is your links of boredom uh, towards um, uh, yeah. So, it's it's your link that you that, that you make between boredom and industrialization, basically. And sometimes um, I've heard people suggest that that one of the reasons for uh, the rise of feminist, uh, feminism, for example, was uh, uh, the, having to endure or being stereotypically uh, cast into very boring roles or something like that. And I, I'm not an expert on this, but I, it, it seems that you touched a bit on that. I, I'm just curious what you think about that. Uh, well, uh, um, uh, here I follow a little bit the, the, the position of Byung-Chul Han, uh, the, the philosopher, uh, who, who saw that uh, well, I, I, I believe I believe that uh, our our experience of boredom became more uh, negative or more serious, more impactant uh, with uh, in, with industrialization and with uh, mostly with the cognitive side impact of, of of industrialization, with advertisement, with media, with with all the things that throughout the twentieth century and be, and even before started changing our 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 mind and our experience. Um, Yes, and and and, uh, and that in a way, uh, these sides, for instance, uh, for me, what was interesting is, for instance, Bian Shalhan says that at a given moment, uh, someone was walking, the one one of the first men was walking, and he was getting bored of walking because he was not working, he was not doing anything, he was just walking, and maybe he started dancing, uh, and maybe that's how dance emerged from a, from an experience of 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 boredom, and I, I find this very interesting interesting because it's something that is not utilitarian, it's not useful at all, uh, but it's something that, as Malevich uh, states, it's something that remains while utility uh, it's 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 lost uh, after uh, a, a given technology becomes obsolete. Of course, it transcends to the next uh, 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 technology, but the experience of of, of of art, of, of, of something useless, uh, it's something that in itself can remain impactant for, for a long time. And I, my position is following uh, also the references. I think it, I recommend this reading of Stiegler. Uh, he shows out a little bit how this productivity and this uh, uh, industri the industrialization of consciousness uh, can become an entrance to experience, uh, not only boredom, but also art forms and the sensitive world. Okay. Interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm.